a friend and colleague from Sheikh Shahbot Medical City, uh, Dr. Sayyid Arif Hussain, consultant pediatric neurologist, and he will be talking to us about an exciting topic, vitamin and supplement responsive childhood neurologic uh, disorders. Uh, Dr. Sayyid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity and I think uh, it's not just exciting, it's actually challenging. Uh, so let's see how I do today. Uh, so I hope this information that I share with you uh, will uh, be helpful for you to incorporate in your practice. Uh, the title of my talk is actually Vitamin and Supplement Responsive Childhood Neurological Disorders. I've divided this talk into two segments. Uh, I will just first talk about the general use of vitamins and supplements. Um, and then I will talk about some of the nutritional deficiency and neurological disorder that respond to nutritional therapies. Okay. All right. Um, as terminology keeps on changing, we refer to these substances as nutraceuticals as well. Uh, nutraceuticals are compounds that may have pharmaceutical implications and as well as health benefits and can uh, be used for uh, health purposes. These include essential uh, vitamins, uh, minerals, trace elements, amino acids, and over a thousand probiotics. Uh, interesting is some, some of them are regulated by uh, agencies such as FDA, but some of them are not. So they are, we all know that vitamins and supplements are used a lot and you don't need a prescription for that. Uh, on the right side up top, you have a list of the partial list of nutraceuticals and at the bottom here is the list of your B vitamins and uh, fat soluble vitamins. So what is the evidence that we should be using vitamins or we should be prescribing it to our children? Um, it's very conflicting. Uh, randomized control trials have not given us any clear idea where routine prescription of vitamins should be done. Uh, in, these are uh, studies in all the subjects but of course, if these are used, useful in older subjects, we can try it on pediatric subjects as well. So in a randomized trial in older individuals uh, on cognitive function, it was, there was no difference between the people who uh, use multivitamins versus the placebo group. Now, there is some uh, good news as well, uh, that in a recent study that was published uh, in 2021 in uh, British Medical Journal Global Health, they showed that micronutrient supplementation may prevent um, upper respiratory infections, vitamin D and C may actually uh, treat and vitamin D, C and zinc may actually uh, uh, treat um, upper respiratory infections, including SARS-CoV-2 infection. But the magnitude of this effect is not clear as of yet. There are plenty of studies. If you Google, you will find it where Observational studies have shown that vitamins are beneficial, supplements are beneficial. And when you look at randomized control data, there is no benefit. And I'm gonna show you, and I learned all of this while preparing for this talk, thanks to Dr. Debussy. Uh, really, it, it was alarming for me. So uh, let's look at some data. Almost 50% of the US adult population have used dietary supplements at some point in their life. 34% of children and adolescents took vitamin and mineral supplements, even though they may not have any medical need for it. Um, there are limited studies in this region. Uh, in, a, in a study in Qatar, almost 50% of college students use some kind of herbal supplement. In a recent study in Ajman University, almost 40% of university students took dietary supplements. It's a huge industry. It's a big business making machinery. Almost $14.3 billion um, was spent on purchase of vitamins and minerals supplements in 2014 in the US alone. And if you look at the trend, it's, it's growing. So why do people think they are beneficial? And why do people think they will improve your brain health? Uh, they might have antioxidant properties. They might have anti-inflammatory properties. They may enhance neuroplasticity. They may improve mitochondrial function, enhance new neurotransmitter production, and they may also have apoptosis. So when you read this, you will be tempted to take vitamins because you think of them as benign substances without any side effects. Um, they are widely used. Now, are, is this a truth or myth? 
Most observational studies suggest, as I previously mentioned, that vitamins and supplements have good effect on general health. But when you look at randomized controlled studies, when an active compound is used against a placebo, no benefit was seen in cardiovascular diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, stroke prevention, dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, and other aging diseases. And definitely more research is needed before we start prescribing people mega doses of multivitamins. Okay, who typically uses vitamins? And I think the observational data is better because often these supplements are used by people who have a healthier lifestyle. They are more educated in general. They are more physically active. They like to eat healthier diet. They are thinner. They're less likely to smoke and they have less like to have chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. So when you look at these studies, they turn out to be good. And, um, and, and it turns out that the people actually using are generally healthier than the people who are actually who are not using these vitamins. So what about antioxidants? There's a rage about using antioxidants, even in the COVID era. And I'm gonna show you this data from this study in JAMA, a very prestigious journal, obviously, use of four um, antioxidants, vitamin A, beta carotene, vitamin E, vitamin C, all had increased death rate compared to people who actually did not take it. I was stunned by this data and I started looking at more data and I found more randomized controlled trials of antioxidants suggesting that antioxidants may not be what you think they do. So the bottom line, uh, should we discourage people from taking antioxidants? I'm not sure, I don't know we have the answer for that. But certainly they do not beneficial, uh, they are not beneficial in longevity. But why? Why? It seems, you know, in incredibly dissatisfying that you can take an antioxidant and you have a higher chance of dying. We have some natural things that are happening in our body, such as production of reactive oxygen species, and they may be actually protective. And these antioxidants may be working against the reactive oxygen species these reactive oxygen species may actually remove bad cells like cancer cells. And by taking an antioxidant, you may block it. So we may be doing ourselves harm than benefit. So I, I'm not telling you not to prescribe antioxidants, but be careful. And there's tons of data to support what I'm telling you. I have not included all of the studies. What about vitamin C? You know, it is true that people who exercise regularly, who are in professional sports, such as marathon or runners, skier soldiers, and people who are doing sub-arctic exercises, they definitely have reduction in the incidence of colds when they consume vitamin C. In general public, almost no reduction. Maybe the slight reduction in the duration of colds. And this was a very large Cochrane review published in 2012. You must be wondering, why am I actually talking about this subject? Uh, good things are to come. What about vitamin B and mortality? This is a very large study uh, published in the Institute of Medicine in 2011. Uh, almost 40,000 women between the ages of 55 and 69 followed, were followed for 19 years who took daily multiple vitamin. And they, then they were compared to general population about the same number of cohort, there was actually a 2.4% absolute increase in mortality in people who actually took B vitamins. There is no randomized control study to show the long-term benefits of B vitamin. Okay, so what do I tell my patients and what you may want to tell your patient is this, that yes, of course, in patients who have nutritional deficiency, they should definitely take vitamin and supplements, no question about that. But for general population, I think the best advice you can give them is to look for natural sources of vitamins, okay? And if you want to give them, uh, give them a daily multivitamin that has the recommended RDA value. And some of the RDA values are listed right here. And I'm happy to share these slides with you. Fat-soluble vitamins. You know, 
water soluble vitamins don't have toxicity even if you consume them in large amounts you can excrete them out but the fat soluble vitamins actually get stored in your body so you should not be using mega doses of fat soluble vitamins and they are present in good food sources they're present in yellow food yellow vegetables green vegetables green um, liver so there are lots of natural sources of getting these fat soluble vitamins that do not lead to toxicity Okay, so in general, nutritional deficiency is a huge public health issue. In a report um, in 2009, there were at least 2 billion people who are living with vitamin and mineral deficiency, and obviously most of them are living in uh, underdeveloped countries. It is estimated that approximately a quarter of a million children worldwide go blind from vitamin A deficiency. Um, uh, a consensus, consensus panel of economists in 2008 ranked the provision of micronutrients as the world's best investment for development. That's a big statement. Why do we get uh, vitamin deficiency? Obviously, there are two main reasons. We don't consume them from food. We live in countries where um, food is not fortified. Secondary deficiency occurs in patients who have malabsorptive diseases. And some of um, what um, I will talk about later are genetic disorders that are associated with um, uh, the, these problems. Secondary deficiency is obviously more challenging to treat than primary nutritional deficiency. So what's the impact of vitamin and mineral deficiencies in children? As you can see this chart uh, on, right here, if you focus, um, if you are vitamin and mineral deficient, nutritional deficient child, children are typically stunted. They have reduced mental capacity. They, have, they are prone to more infections. Their catch-up growth is slow, uh, reduced uh, reproductivity, higher mortality rate. And the same thing goes on for kids, adolescents as well. So eating a good nutritional diet and supplementing these things in people who are nutritionally deficient is, is very important. And there are WHO impl implemented programs that have made a huge impact. Uh, I just mentioned about vitamin A and its relationship to blindness. And when foods have been fortified and children are being given good nourishment, there's been great reduction in mortality associated with vitamin A deficiency. And there's 70% reduction in childhood blindness. That's a big breakthrough, I think. Just investing in good nutrition has led to that. Cretinism is also elimin almost eliminated from the world. And kids who have iodine deficiency are prone to um, intellectual impairment. And supplementing iodine in, in salt and diets have uh, in, increase their IQ point. And there are roles of other um, trace elements as well. Folate, I don't have to mention, folate is protective against development of neural tube defects and we are all aware of it. Okay, so when you look at the development quotient on non-stunted versus stunted children, the stop broken line shows normal IQ in non-stunted children, meaning they are well nourished. When you have stunted children, when they are stimulated, nurtured well, and they're supplemented, they catch up and their IQ gets better. So this illustrates the importance of good nutrition for intellectual development. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the topic that I was actually supposed to speak, but I, I thought it is relevant to, for our practices to know how, I didn't know this, that I, many patients will come to me and say, doctor, should I take a multivitamin? I would say, yeah, go ahead, take it. It won't harm you. But there is data to suggest that excessive use of vitamins may be harmful. But, so there are a number of neurological disorders. They are all almost genetically based. They are associated with um, mutations that lead to uh, these disorders. And they are responsive to nutritional therapies. And I will talk about a few of them. Okay, we all know this, neonatologists are very aware of it. Our neonatologists frequently call us for children who are in the neonatal intensive care unit. We have a five-day-old with you know, uh, intractable neonatal seizures. And one of the things we immediately think about in the region we live is pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy. Pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy can occur due to uh, mutations in two enzymes. The first one, which is the most common, is the AL ALDH7A1. Um, Children present with neonatal refractory seizures, encephalopathy, the EEG shows burst suppression pattern here. Um, uh, there are some markers that can identify this disorder, such as increased pipicolic acid in plasma and CSF, and pyridoxine challenge 
can actually clinch the diagnosis. So children who have pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy, especially due to ALDH7A1 mutation, respond to pyridoxine challenge. You give 50 to 100 milligrams of IV pyridoxine, which can result in dramatic change in the EEG as shown here. The birth suppression pattern disappears, the EEG normalizes, and the seizures also stop. So these children require lifelong pyridoxine um, uh, treatment. The other one that's quite common, and these are actually seen in the UA, by the way, we have uh, uh, consanguineous families and we see a lot of autosomal recessive neurological disorders. And this is one of the commonest ones. So pyridoxal 5-phosphate dependency epilepsy, it is due to deficiency, due to mutation of, how can I go back? Okay, I got it, I got it. Sorry. Okay. So PNPO deficiency, just quick um, um, reminder for that, that it presents like uh, the ALDH7A1 mutation, but it does not respond to pyridoxine, by the way, because the pathways involve pyridoxal phosphate as well. So these ch children need supplementation with both, uh, sorry, supplemented with pyridoxal phosphate. And the EEGs are very similar. They also prevent, present with the neonatal refractory seizures. They might even have hypoglycemia and lacticosis, lactic acidosis. And something that I have observed, and there's subject of publication, many of these children for some reason are premature. Okay, um, so these are the two most common causes of pyridoxine dependent epilepsy, but there are others as well. Okay, so this is a new mutation that has been identified that also responds to pyridoxine. This is called the PL. BP gene, and it's been described in a cohort of families in, uh, in French Canadian families. It presents with neonatal seizures, metabolic acidosis, high lactate, high pyruvate, high concentration of creatine kinase. These constellation of signs and symptoms might make you think about mitochondrial pathology, but when mitochondrial genome studies and other studies to look out for mitochondrial disorders, well, then they were negative, and on whole genome sequencing, this deletion was identified. Uh, the EEGs are not pathognomonic. They look like any other abnormal EEG with multifocal spike. What's interesting in these kids is the presence of, which doesn't show here well, temporal cysts. So this may be a pathognomonic sort of sign for these babies who have neonatal refractory seizures. They are also pyridoxine uh, dependent and uh, need lifelong treatment. Another pyridoxine dependent epilepsy um, is uh, pyridoxine dependent epileptic encephalopathy with hypophosphatasia. It's very rare and I will won't discuss this today. So what about cerebral folate, also known as folionic acid? Um, Presentation is with neonatal seizures. These babies are very irritable. They have insomnia. They have microcephaly, hypotonia, spasticity. Additional signs include visual disturbances, hearing loss, and some of the older children who have chronic folate deficiency tend to have autistic features. Two types are recognized. One is the autoimmune folate antibody related epilepsy, and the other one is due to the uh, uh, FOLR1 transporter mutation related epilepsy. Uh, these children might have some clue on the MRI. These calcifications are seen uh, in the periventricular region in the basal ganglia and, and demyelination is also observed. Um, uh, not easy because these are non-specific MRI findings. There's a good CSF biomarker, which is uh, that they have extremely low levels of methyl tetrahydrofolate and the treatment is with oral folinic acid, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg, and you can give a maximum of about 50 milligram. Biotinidase, I think you all must have seen it or heard about it. Uh, biotinidase deficiency, I'm talking about genetic mutations, most of it, and the uh, and this occurs from a mutation in a BTT gene. Uh, almost 75 mutations have been identified on on this gene. This disorder can be detected by newborn screening. The phenotype includes infantile seizure, which can present as West syndrome, hypotonia, developmental delay. They have respiratory problems. Some of them have severe respiratory problem and may they go into respiratory arrest. They might also have visual problems. And of course they have some physical uh, signs such as alopecia and rash on the skin. So uh, these babies can be picked up, but some of the, these ba babies don't have these physical characteristics very er early on in life. And treatment is with lifelong biotin, five to 20 milligram per day can reverse all symptoms.
Vitamin B12, we had some discussions about vitamin B12. Uh, this can occur due to maternal B12 deficiency in breast, uh, primarily breastfed infants. Um, seizures, a wide variety of seizures can be seen in these patients, including atonic, myoclonic, focal seizures. And there are some reports of um, infantile spasms in patients with vitamin B12 deficiency as well. And their EEGs look like any other EEG with infantile spasm that is burst suppression pattern, which is a very, sorry, a hip arrhythmia, which is a very chaotic EEG with multifocal spikes. Uh, this diagram, I put it deliberately because this shows an abnormal signal in the spinal cord. Some of these children actually have um, almost uh, symptoms of like um, adult B12 de deficiency with sub subacute combined degeneration. A uh, good myo biomarker for this uh, disorder is elevated methylmalonic acid and ele elevated levels of uh, homocysteine. Um, serum B12 levels are very unreliable and many of these children do not have macrocytic anemia. These children require weekly injections of a thousand microgram of hydroxycobalamin or cobalamin for three months followed by maintenance injections every three months. And th these disorders are actually quite prevalent in, in countries where there is nutritional deficiency. Dr. Um, Fisher talked about Turkey. I don't know why in Turkey, but in the Indian subcontinent, uh, you may want to look out for these disorders. This is an interesting disorder with movement disorder, biotin, thymine responsive, basal ganglia disease. It's often triggered by an infection or stress, typically on of symptoms as three to 10 years of age. Children present with re recurrent attacks of intermittent subacute encephalopathy, abnormal movements and seizures, and some of them go into coma and die. Cranial nerve palsies are also seen, supranuclear facial palsy, ophthalmoplegia, uh, dysphagia, and this is due to a pathogenic mutation of the SLC19A3 gene. Uh, when patients present with this order, you can see this very high signal abnormality in the caudate head and basal ganglia with sparing of the thalami and the globus pallidus. And after treatment, everything resolves. So this is really treatable disorder if identified early. So all of these disorders that I'm talking about, we should think about them early on because this can really present, uh, prevent morbidity. Another disorder that is associated with vitamin B12 is known as the infantile tremor syndrome. Uh, children present with a characteristic cry. They have generalized tremorlessness, which might look like epilepsy and seizures. And if you don't treat them with supplemental vitamin B12, developmental regression and long-term intellectual disability can result. Am I good for time? Yeah. Okay. So, sorry? The advantage of being the last speaker, I wouldn't, I ha I wouldn't hassle work. you, you have the okay. whole. Great, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that people are enjoying it too, that's more important. So uh, vitamin E deficiency should always be thought of in patients who have ataxia. Uh, we see a lot of genetic uh, kinds of ataxia, but we often don't think about vitamin, we think about ataxia till injectasia, we think about Frederick's ataxia, we think about a beta lipoproteinemia, but the first thing I would suggest pediatricians to do to look for vitamin E deficiency. And um, this AVED is an autosomal recessive condition associated with defect caused by mutations in the tocopherol transfer protein gene. Clinically, it can look like Frederick ataxia and it can also have other symptoms such as uh, gaze paresis, nystagmus and retinitis pigmentosa. Very similar symptom to some genet other genetic uh, ataxia. So um, think about vitamin E defici deficiency in patients you suspect of genetic ataxia. Okay, this is an interesting disorder, which is thymine B1 responsive acute encephalopathy, or also known as infantile beriberi. It presents with a pseudo meningitic kind of picture with children having muscular fasciculation, nystagmus, ophthalmoplegia, tense fontanelle, seizures, and they can go into coma. And they're suspected of having actually a meningitis, bacterial meningitis like picture, but the CSF is unremarkable in these uh, patients. High lactate and low levels of 5 hydro indolic acid may be a biomarker. Uh, affected children show uh, high signal abnormality in the basal anglia in acute situations. Uh, this results from low thymine intake by mothers and low thymine markers are found both in mother and infant. These babies initially to reverse this encephalopathy require IV thymine high doses, okay, and then subsequent thymine maintenance. 
Okay, vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. You know, everybody, there's a rave about vitamin D. Even in COVID, you know, people want to take tons of vitamin D. Multiple sclerosis is a multifactorial demyelinating disease. You all know about it. It does occur in pediatric, by the way. It occurs in males and females, females more, but it 5% of cases of multiple sclerosis are pediatric onset MS. So what's the role of vitamin D deficiency and multiple sclerosis? Vitamin D is unlike any other vitamin. It's a steroid hormone actually, but a good one that causes immunomodulation and neuroprotection. Vitamin D risk has been proposed as a risk factor for MS development. In a longitudinal Canadian study of 302 children with acute demyelinating syndrome, low vitamin D levels significantly increase the risk of developing multiple sclerosis in the next three years. There are some interesting genetic markers now that you can look for. Uh, SNP poly polymorphisms in these two genes that are listed here, uh, new for me as well, so I don't know them quite well. Um, the gene risk scores of these uh, SNPs can identify children who are at higher risk of developing um, multiple sclerosis relapses. So this is a good breakthrough in science. The recommended daily dose of vitamin D for patients with multiple sclerosis is about 1,000 international units um, to maintain a level above 100 nanomoles per liter. Uh, and these are the classic sort of like pictures that you see with with demyelinating plaques in patients with MS, and there is a lesion in the spine. I think I talked about this, right? Did I, am I moving forward or backward? Okay, migraine. Of course, everybody you know, wants to take some supplement for migraines. It's huge. The most common nutraceutical compound that's used for migraines is magnesium. Now, when you look at randomized controlled studies, there was no difference between people who actually took magnesium or placebo. There was no difference in randomized controlled trial. It is widely used by the way. Uh, side effects were more common in the magnesium. What about riboflavin, other nutraceutical? Two retrospective studies involving children and adolescents with different types of headache use riboflavin without any evidence of efficacy. So they cannot be prescribed in routine clinical practice for prophylaxis of migraine. Coenzyme Q10 might have some effectiveness for prophylaxis of migraine, but again, randomized control studies have not shown any statistical significance. What about fish oil? In a small randomized control trial conducted on 27 adolescents with chronic migraine, fish oil and fish oils that contain X, Y, and Z fatty acids, I cannot pronounce them, and tocopherol showed equal efficacy as a placebo. So what I'm trying to tell you is that use of these nutraceuticals in migraine doesn't have much evidence to support its use. Other things such as melatonin, pyridoxine, vitamin B12, folate, and vitamin D, very limited data available for prophylaxis of migraine in children. So in summary, evidence of the efficacy of nutraceuticals for the treatment of pediatric migraine is up for grabs, nobody knows. Nutraceuticals for mitochondrial cytopathy. This is an area where probably nutraceuticals are important in mitochondrial disorders. So CoQ10, ubiquinone, and B vitamins are the most common mitochondrial cocktail that are pre prescribed for patients with mitochondrial cytopathies. Okay, they, they do have antioxidant properties and we know that mitochondrial disorder is a disorder of energy failure. So these might work there actually. Uh, coenzyme Q10 biosynthetic defects such as neonatal encephalopathy with nephropathy, lays like syndrome. These are disorders that can really respond beautiful to CoQ10 supplements. What about MILAS, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like syndrome. Other mito another neurological mitochondrial disorder it has been shown and proven that arginine supplements in these patients can actually prevent strokes. And they can be very useful for acute strokes as well. Patients who present where, who, with a TIA or something. If you, if you know that they have MILAS, you can give them infusions of, um, of arginine to prevent the progression of stroke. Many patients require regular maintenance of 150 to 300 milligram um, IV in two to three uh, doses. What about mitochondrial myopathies? Uh, treatment with creatine has been shown, but not uh, good results. Other redox agents are B1, vitamin C, vitamin E, alpha uh, lipoic acid, all have been used in mitochondrial diseases, but the efficacy is not established. Folic acid, I don't need to tell you guys, um, 
there is greater than 70% reduction in neural tube defects in women who have had prior history of neural tube defects, such as anencephaly and spina bifida. So we all know we have to recommend vitamin, um, uh, sorry, folic acid for, uh, for women with childbearing age in, in the amount of 0.4 to 8 milligrams per day. Iron deficiency, Dr. Fisher alluded to it, very important. There are a wide variety of neurological symptoms, I won't call them disorders, that can result from vitamin deficiency. Iron is very abundant in the brain. Uh, it is vital for many cellular functions, neurotransmitter synthesis, myelination of the neurons, and also for mitochondrial function. As Dr. Fisher mentioned, energy boost, you know. Uh, so we can't ignore vitamin deficiency. They have been shown in open label studies to occur with more uh, uh, vitamin deficiency is more common in kids with febrile seizures, kids who have attention deficit disorder, restless leg syndrome. Breath holding is an important one. I see them in the clinic. The first thing I do is check their iron, check their ferritin. Uh, of course, with uh, some of the iron, iron deficiency uh, syndrome, we can see benign intracranial hypertension. So this is something to look for in adolescents that are obese. And we think about obesity as a cause of intracranial hypertension. We should also focus on if they have iron deficiency. Okay, so please prevent, identify and treat um, iron deficiency in women of childbearing age during gestation and throughout infancy and childhood. So conclusions, nutritional deficiency disorders are common in underdeveloped countries due to poverty, obviously. They don't get the right nutrition. Early recognition and treatment are paramount to decreasing morbidity and mortality in, in these subgroup of children. Routine use of vitamins and supplements are not indicated in well-nourished children or kids who are on balanced and fortified diets. It is not supported by randomized controlled studies. Vitamin and supplements should be used according to the recommended RDA values. So taking a multivitamin on a daily basis or recommending to your patients in the right RDA amounts, is, it's all right. Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you, there are a lot of neonatal epileptic encephalopathies and other neurological conditions that can respond very well to these nutritional therapy. Key is thinking about them, identifying them early and fixing the problem can give lifelong, um, um, you know, um, success. Physicians should routinely consider and identify nutritional, genetic, metabolic, treatable disorders in the differential diagnosis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Said, for supplementing the day. Uh, any questions from the audience or present here? Yeah, would you give the mic to our colleague there? Thank you very much for the um, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, we know that teenagers is very um, difficult to convince them to have a healthy meal. Um, now most of the teenagers is taking like junk food, fast food and these things. So uh, if, uh, it's, uh, uh, there is chance they have vitamin deficiency regarding because of this fast food and junk food. Is it uh, good to encourage them to take multivitamins for that one? Or? Yeah, good question. I, I did address that issue uh, because it's a frequently asked question. First of all, tell the parents to not supersize their meals, okay? And the same thing for not supersizing the vitamins. You can absolutely recommend them to take a daily multivitamin with good supplements in it according to the RDA value. And within months, the levels should be okay. So yes, you should recommend in kids who are not necessarily undernourished or malnourished, but eating the wrong kinds of foods. Because the key to these nutritional deficiencies is not having the nutritional deficiency to have a balanced diet. Any questions from the audience in here? Uh, there are questions online. Uh, one of our colleagues online asking about the uh, vitamin C deficiency scurvy. Is it still, is it in history books or? Is, scurvy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost eliminated. Right. Yeah, but uh, I, I did read about it and I didn't include it because it's really irrelevant now. 
Right. One of uh, our colleagues is rightly uh, saying that it's important to stress that the risk of uh, hypervitaminosis yeah. is, is could be as problematic as vitamin and uh, yeah, especially for trace the fat-soluble vitamins. Especially for the fat-soluble vitamins, you have to be careful because your body can store it. It likes it. You, especially if you are taking an un unhealthy diet, and on top of that, you are supersizing your multivitamin doses. You may get hypervitaminosis. And uh, there are multiple problems, including intracranial hypertension with uh, hypervitaminosis. Uh, so I absolutely agree and appreciate that point. Uh, one last question online. Uh, what is the presentation of copper deficiency? Any Which one? Copper deficiency. Copper? I don't know. <laughs> right. Honest answers, I don't know, actually. I didn't look, look it up. Okay, if there are no uh, questions. Let me take a disclaimer. I'm yeah. not a vitamin expert, <laughs> and I don't have a vitamin shop, Okay. But I'll tell you, right. I'll tell you something. Can I say, tell some something? Yeah, sure, sure. Many years ago, a friend of mine, he was a pharmacist actually in the US and he got very rich. He stopped his practice. I said, what did you do, man? He opened vitamin shops. From one, he had six. You can see that industry. I mean, everybody likes to take vitamins. So I think we are in the wrong business. But I'm, I've convinced myself it's the wrong business to go into for ethical reasons. If there are no further questions, uh, uh, this will be the conclusion of uh, our uh, day two.